We are going to be talking about how to make your silver years absolutely amazing, feeling 20, 30 years or younger, um, being very specific to gender, talking about food and nutrition, talking about exercise and training specifics. It's going to be an absolutely amazing show. Uh, if you're not familiar with us at The Fitness Doctor, you're not a VIP or you're, this is your first time being connected with myself, then uh, the Full Body Fix Coaching Show is a coaching show where myself and or other elite world-class experts come together and share with you some very powerful information on wellness, health, fitness, and all things related to those subjects. Uh, also, once per quarter, we run something called a Full Body Fix event. And this is where my myself and my world-class team introduce you to a world-class anti-aging and therapeutic fitness training system, which basically means, you know how when you get near the age of 50 and over, you start to get more stiffness, pain, dysfunction, joint issues, muscle loss, fat gain, like all these type of things. Well, we go through a full free week event where we teach you all about how to fix your body, fix your body mechanics specific uh, to your age. We go from your toe all the way to your head, teaching you all these things. We do that for free. We do it once per quarter. Uh, at the end of that, you get to learn how to become a VIP, but it's totally free for that entire week. Uh, we have live Q&As after the hour-long training sessions. It's absolutely amazing. There's no rigorous exercise involved. So regardless of your fitness level, it'll be totally matched to you. Patricia will drop a link in the chat right now, and you can schedule yourself to attend our next Full Body Fix event if you would like to do that. And it is on uh, November 5th. Is that correct, Patricia? Our next event starts on November 5th. That's correct. And it's five awesome. days. So the link for scheduling has five days and three times, three time options. Awesome. Thank you. And now on to today's show. Boy, do we have an amazing uh, treat for you today. Uh, I have an amazing woman, someone who I consider uh, a friend and someone who I consider a true expert in her fields and someone who truly cares with the level of heart and passion uh, that the way that the fitness doctor runs and the way that we really like to connect with our VIPs. So she's really a very ideally aligned expert to come on the show with me and talk to you about uh, the areas that she's an elite expert in, which happens to be primarily in the area of women's uh, health, women's fitness. So guys uh, in attendance, don't worry, we're going to definitely drop you some golden nuggets. But uh, women, you're really definitely in for a treat today because there's going to be a lot of specifics shared with you that you'll get a ton of value from. Now, normally I give uh, my, my own version of introduction, but uh, Deborah's introduction, which I have in written form here, I absolutely cannot beat. And she has a, a stacked uh, history of things she's done and achieved. So I'll go ahead and share that with you. And then I'll bring Deborah on to the show with me. So uh, Deborah is a functional and Deborah Atkinson is a functional health coach, hormone balancing fitness expert, and flipping 50 founder. Uh, Deborah has helped over 250,000 women flip their second half with the vitality and energy they want. She's the best-selling author of You Still Got It, Girl, You Still Got It, Girl. Don't let me mess that one up. The author of You Still Got It, Girl, The After 50 Fitness Formula for Women, Navigating fit Fitness After 50, Your GPS for Choosing Programs and Professionals You Can Trust, and Hot, Not Bothered, which I love that title. Very funny. And, and uh, that's awesome. I know the women can relate to that. So Hot, Not Bothered, and Deborah hosts Flipping 50 TV and the Flipping 50 podcast, an AARP top podcast for 50 plus. She is a frequent speaker and TEDx presenter of everything women in menopause learned about exercise may be a lie. And that has 503,000 views. So people definitely want to hear uh, what she has to share. Uh, she has 38 years full-time fitness experience as an international fitness presenter for associations including International Council on Active Aging, I IDEA, NSCA, which is the top strength training uh, and conditioning association, 
and Athletic Business and Can Fit Pro. She's an American Council on Exercise subject matter expert and prior senior lecturer in kinesiology at Iowa, Iowa State University. Deborah is also founder of Flipping50.com and creator of the Flipping50 Fitness Specialist Program for Fitness Professionals. She's a frequent contributor at Huffington Post, uh, Share, Share Care, and other featured outlets, and on the Education Advisory Board of MedFit.org. With that being said, let's get into some awesome connection and personal connections here. Deborah, welcome to the Full Body Fix. Hey, good to see you this morning. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. So great to be connecting with you here. Really looking forward for what we're about to uh, provide to our amazing, amazing audience here. So Deborah, what do you what do you think when you think about like women's health and everything you just saw come in the chat? Like what what is it that women really need to do? What is their structure of like their nutrition need to look like? And where where is it so common that they're missing some things? that really, really need in there, or maybe they're doing some things nutrition wise, that's like, yeah, a lot of people think this should be good, but it's really not. So that's a little bit of a loaded question, but that is so it. loaded. That yeah, is so is. loaded. <laughs> and okay. If you need me to repeat any of that, let me know. And I'll, I'll repeat <laughs> one by one by one. So starting with the umbrella answer to that big umbrella question, you know, but I think broadly, the biggest myth misconception that women intentionally are doing but unintentionally making a mistake is generally they're actually eating too little and not getting enough micronutrients not fueling enough for the activity that many are holding themselves to so you know you wouldn't expect your car to go if you didn't have any gas in the tank, but yet we often do that to ourselves. So I, I think blanket statement is biggest mistake I see and hear from clients who I start working with is not that they're eating too much, but maybe even that they're gaining weight because they're eating too little. It's caused their body to shut down. And so the rule of thumb is actually opposite what you might think, but the more you give your body, the more your body will burn. Now there's a point where we can't say that's chocolate cake and it's this. And, you know, I mean, we have to be a little careful and responsible with that, but the less you feed your body, the less it's going to burn. And the more energy deprived you're going to feel, it's going to do everything it can to slow you down. So I think when we want you know, yes, we want to change muscle and we want to reduce fat. We also want energy while we're doing it and we need it in order to do the exercise. So that's a blanket statement. Robbie, how about you? I mean, what are you noticing? So that is so true. Like that's the biggest hurdle I've had when I've really done personalized nutrition help and care with, with our clients is they don't eat enough. They really, there's, so there's like the stigma, there's this idea that really you need to eat less or like smaller portions. And there's, it's true, like, especially in the typical Western diet, right? The sad diet, standard American diet, which is sad. Um, but the reality is exactly what you're saying, Deborah. is you, the way, think about that you are what you eat. So what do you want to be? What are all those comments? We saw strong, we saw muscle. We saw mm -hmm. energy. We saw functionality. Okay, bone let's, so let's yeah. bone density. So let's reverse engineer that, right? Mm -hmm. If that's our goal, what do we have to start from? We see protein. That's the thing that builds Building. your muscle yeah. and even, yeah. even, even builds bone, bone really, because you have better connective tissue. You're going to increase the stimulus to the bone. We see vitamins, minerals. So then I see vegetables, fruit. Other healthy organic plant sources doesn't have to be organic, but fruits and vegetables. I see high levels of hydration. Everything happens in hydration. Oh, gosh, yeah. So having a good amount of water, be it feeding yourself all those nutrients, and those are really the primary building blocks. Of course, like you said, Deborah, like it's yeah, it's not about chocolate cake, but it's about having a nutrient dense diet where you're loading your body with those things pretty much on a daily basis. So, you know. Really? There's been so much talk of in the last decade, I would say, about fasting. This I knew fasting, you were going to say the F yeah, word. Yeah. I knew you were going to use the F word. <laughs> the F word. Yeah, exactly. 
It's a family exactly. show. Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, That's and, a loaded question. Could we ask everybody to comment in the thread? Are you confused by should you or shouldn't you fast? Just a quick yes or no. So I'm just going to be like, well, of course, why would I be any other way? But I'm going to be totally open and honest with this. Like at first when I saw fasting, because my experience was always giving clients nutrient dense diets and building them into exactly what you just said, Deborah. Yeah. Then, then I started to see, all right, let me, I try to keep an open mind, like, cause it's science. So, you know, right. you always have the outliers and you have like, it's not always this, always that sometimes, you know, yeah. it depends like who's the human that we're dealing with. What is, so where I've seen fasting work is like, if, if that's the way you're going to lose body fat, you're better in that and you're having trouble doing everything else, but that works for you. I would see that working for some time period to get yourself into a fitter state, into a less body fat state. And, mm -hmm. but long-term you're going to need to change that. So I think it can be a nice interim plan. If like, that's the thing they mentally, emotionally connect with, then I yeah. think there's a lot of power in that. And lastly, I think there's a lot of power in like, if you, when you sleep, and you don't have all this food in your gut when you go to sleep. I think there's a lot of immunological benefits and recovery and things we can do with fasting. How, how do you feel about this? Subject? Totally agree. And I think for, for you and I, but for everybody listening as well, I think we have to say, what is fasting? Because if we've got 500 people here, we could have 500 different ideas of what, is, what does that mean? There's a broad continuum. That's the way I like to think of it on Here's what I'd love to see everybody doing in terms of fasting, except potentially somebody who's dealing with a lot of cortisol issues or adrenal fatigue. And I know that's a that's a lay term, not necessarily recognized by medicine, but it's HPA access dysfunction. So you've got a lot of fatigue, chronic fatigue is what it feels like. You probably will do better eating smaller meals and snacks to stabilize that blood sugar first. But I'm talking about those of you who feel good. I'd love to see everybody do three meals, no snacks, and at least 12 hours overnight. And for a lot of Americans, less so elsewhere, that's a fast because we're snacking and grazing all day long. And because we shortchange ourselves sometimes at meals, kind of diet mentality, not eating very much, we do get hungry, you know, if we're not doing that, your body is saying, hey, you didn't give me enough fuel. So uh, I'm not up to par yet. So I need some more. It's going to tell you that. But if you have all your micronutrients sufficiently at your meals, you will coast from meal to meal with high energy, not really even thinking or being distracted by food. So I, I'd like to see that as a first step, you know, and then there's the well, maybe we extend that to 13 hours overnight or 14, but I think you also then have to continuously course correct. How do I do with that? Um, and sometimes a continuous blood glucose monitor can be effective because I've seen people do okay, do well with 12 hours and find that they are diligently fasting and they're making it 14 or 16 hours but their blood sugar level is going up. So even though fasting they think is going to help them burn more fat, they're actually, they're going into carbohydrate and sugar burning and fat storage because their body is getting stressed. So it's very unique and individual to you and potentially to the moment that you're in. If you're under a lot of other stressors, fasting may not be what you need right now. So listening to your body, what results are you getting? Because that's the feedback from the habits that you have right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, kind of what I'm hearing you saying that is there's, so as a scientist, kind of what I see is like, there's, yeah. there's a longevity benefit to fasting by putting your body sure. into this type of stress that fasting creates. But mm -hmm. like you just said, this is a, this is a stress by not by not eating enough and then especially if you're doing exercise you're going to have greater cellular structure breakdown muscle breakdown and this is a larger immunological hit uh, so your yeah. immune system repairs your tissue so 
you know, right. if you're if you're fasting or exercising or breaking down your cellular structure, but you don't have the nutrients to protect it, this is going to be an additional hit. And I know something you're an expert on is like adrenal fatigue in women and menopause and not mm-hmm. overdoing these things. And when you start combining all those factors, it's very easy to overtrain and put yourself in like a constant chronic fatigue state. So true. So for anybody who is fasting, because yes, I mean, we have to agree there are volumes of data suggesting that at the cellular level, there is regeneration and it can be helpful. But I think you're just trying to find that sweet spot. You know, where is fasting? I'm getting benefits. I'm getting enough benefits, but I'm also fueling for the exercise I want to do. So one of the things I tell women in our community is exercise during that fed window, not when you're fasted during that fed window. And the research existing on women in midlife and beyond doing fasting and exercising while they're fasted is minimal. So we really have to piece together the science on women how many, what percent tend to already be tired, have some source of adrenal fatigue, because when estrogen comes down, cortisol goes up and it makes us more susceptible to those negative effects of stress. It's why women experience something called exercise intolerance often during menopause relative to themselves. We can get into that, but there's no evidence that fasting helps women burn more fat, none. So if we say, well, let's err on the conservative side then and eat and exercise together in that same window and then use the fasting appropriately, otherwise we're going to get better results. So what do you say for like, like Jen just posted a comment, good, great comment, Jen, uh, because there's a lot of people that feel like Jen, like when I fast for 16 plus hours, I have amazing energy. Like yeah. a lot of people feel I have, you know, and And there's different somatotypes, right? And so Mm -hmm. somatotype is like, whether you're naturally more um, excess body fat, whether you're naturally more muscular, or whether you're naturally like thin, straight frame type of body. And most people aren't one of those categories. There's like a mixture of those categories and, you know, dominant more in one, but a little mixture of the others. Yeah. So that can change with your somatotype. Uh, So what do you, what do you think about that? Totally agree. And I think you're kind of talking endomorph, ectomorph, mesomorph. Um, To Jen's question um, or her comment about, uh, you know, in a shorter eating window, she loves the energy she has when she fasts more. That means her eating window is shorter. It's hard to put three meals in there. And that's, that's very true. I think this is kind of where we're going. We want to talk a little bit about, I wish I had a prescription medicine bottle right here, but I don't. But we also want to think about taking your doses of protein regularly and consistently. And I think sometimes we get into the habit of thinking if I'm fasting and I'm doing, I'm doing 16 hours of fasting, you don't have to do that every day to get significant benefits. You might just do that two days a week. And then alternate plan. So it's a little bit more normal on your, say, your exercise days, allowing for protein and protein and protein. So if you went home from the doctor's office and they gave you, here's your prescription, need you to take these three times a day with breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you would not say, well, I'm just going to take like one and a half twice And um, I'll be good with that because that doesn't do the same thing like an IV drip going into your body, keeping it consistent. So, you know, we would never, ever do that. Am I right? I hope. (laughs) But um, similarly with protein, you know, the dose response is really there. So we can simulate certain amounts of protein per meal. And we want to hit a threshold of about 30 grams. But you know, there's a point where we can't eat more than that. Some women are like, that's, I'm full. I am just, I I can't, we don't want you to be uncomfortable either because that's ignoring your body's response, ignoring your hormone telling you you're sated. So we don't want that. We want to try to close that window, however. And then we want to give you those hits at three different times, because that's going to be so much more beneficial. And if we can, bookending your workouts 
So loading, you already are high protein, ready to go. And then afterward, you're recovering with a good high protein meal. But that's going to last for about 24 hours where you've got increased muscle protein synthesis, which, you know, by this time, you're not as good at that as you were 10 or 20 years ago. So you to you and nothing else really matters. We need that bump, meaning use of the protein that we consume to the benefit of our muscles declines with age. It's better if you're active and fit. We get better at it. Um, so something to cons be concerned of, but we boost it by exercise, strength training specifically, and we also boost it with a high protein meal. So if you can take the two of those and lock them together more frequently through the week, gold, right? You're going to age differently. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. So like one of the things that I'm thinking and hearing you say also is, so that you're the the larger amount of protein at once, like the fasting plan of the two meals. So if mm -hmm. you're getting like 60 and 60 grams of protein or 50 and 50, you're you're not going to have the same muscle protein stimulus, most muscle protein synthesis mm -hmm. stimulus effect from this mm -hmm. large amount with one intake as you are like 30 grams or 25, depending on the individual and their body weight and such but like 25, 30 grams and, and twice or, you know, four times in the day, you're going to get that leucine, which is really the trigger for your muscle sure. protein synthesis more often. And you're going to take it because your body might not want to, like you might not be in a state that's that what's called anabolic at that point. But if you're keeping those regular, it's kind of like investing in the market, right? It's like investing in the market. Like you don't go all in, you do drips. Why do most like intelligent investors do drips into the market? Because they don't know where the market's going to be, but by investing over time and steady allocations, they end up winning more than like buying all in at, at, at a high or at a low. And like, you don't know when those highs and lows are going to, but if you have that consistency, then you're always going to be taking advantage of your anabolic states. And I think that's, I think that's really the underlying factor of why that's so important, you know, and it's, and it's interesting because a lot of people are like, oh, you know, they've, it's, it's not that it doesn't work because I know there's a lot of like, and there's a lot of individuals in the chat sharing and this, I hear this all the time about fasting. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, it worked. I got lean. This person did, they, you know, they had more energy, but it's like, yeah, but is it the best? So mm -hmm. like, is it the best, is that the best way? Right. And, and so and I really think it's it's for most individuals, it's not it's not the best way to do like fasting all the time like that. You want to have nutrient density, because if you ask if we ask everyone here, what do you care more about, vitality or longevity? Like if you have to pick one, if you're going to have enough of one, but you can really push the other, they're going to choose vitality. I've done this and asked this question many times in large audience. The answer is always heavily weighted to vitality. Well, eating more often small meal, we're not talking about gorging yourself and like going crazy. That's not the conversation here. It's eating healthy, smaller meals, having still a window that you're not eating. Like you said, Deborah, 12 hours, right? Yeah. So we're not talking about like gorging yourself into the evening. That's definitely not what we're talking about. So you're going to have more steady nutrient intake and you will get mu better muscle protein synthesis. You will get better results. And I, I, I've never seen someone who is in the peak of their physical fitness ability and body state and doing like fasting. It just, it just, True. that, so that usually doesn't happen unless they're in a bad, again, if they're in a bad state and they eat a bunch of crap and they eat a bunch of crap before they go to bed and now they fast and they're like, look how well fasting will eat of yeah, like, hello, you know, you stopped <laughs> eating all this junk at night, you ch of course, that's going to work. Of course, that's going to work. And there's a lot of benefits. And there's longevity benefits to it. Right? I forget the guy's oh, name, but, but he's out of Harvard. Um, I'm sure you know, I did a show that we heavily talked about this, but it's all about like longevity, and what he's claiming with fasting, and you don't want too much muscle protein synthesis, because he's like, like, he has blinders on looking at only the longevity window and not considering the vitality. Window. Yeah. It's uh, Walter Longo is his mm. name. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think somebody tried to put that in the chat too. Yeah. I think it's Longo. Yeah. He's a, he's a member of the mastermind that I belong to. So um, 
huge truth, but, and I think study of ones so important. Somebody put that in the chat. It's exactly true. I mean, you are unique. You have a unique gut microbiome, a unique history of exercise of, of so many things and, and food actually, and your food tolerance right now, but, you know, back to, we talked about dose response and getting in adequate amounts of protein evenly throughout the day. You know, two different studies I'll just throw out. So one was published back in 2013 in Obesity Journal, and, and it found that women who had excess weight needed to lose weight, lost it easier and lost more of it. This is a really important point I think we need to make that people are not just losing weight um, and finding that to be true, but they're monitoring their muscle amount of muscle and then the amount of fat to be sure, are you losing the right thing? Because that will come back to bite you literally in the butt, right? I mean, so there's no way around that one. But uh, in o obesity journal, it found that three evenly distributed meals of high protein synthesis, even on a calorie deficit, helped women lose weight without losing muscle. So that's an important consideration. The other one is back to when you have a really short eating window and you might be just eating two meals during that period of time, that was found to be acceptable with older women, but it was the minimum. And so we're talking about the difference between kind of preventing disease versus getting vitality. So I, you know, I think it's important that we distinguish well, it's maybe not going to hurt you, but it may not move you to where you want to go. Yeah. So, and, and yeah, exactly. That's like how I look at it. Like if you're in a state that like fasting you connect with and like, I can do that and it works for you, mm -hmm. do it. But like this eating consistently does, then don't do that. Even though it would be better nutrient denser, you're going to thrive more you're better off doing this plan because you're going to survive more. It basically, because you're going to be, if it's like unhealthy state or like not getting in enough nutrients or, or getting in enough nutrients and having it be totally optimal. You know, if, if you're not going to make that happen, you'd be better off making this happen. You know, that's, that's really how I end up seeing it. And it, and it becomes such an emotional thing. Like for me, it's not an emotional thing. One of the reasons why I know this is true is because I know every individual, regardless of age, who's the most fit, eats a nutrient dense diet. They might fast exactly like you said, like the best there's experts that are scientists that all they do is like study fasting. And what will they tell you? And like metabolic um, adjustments, like if you're eating high calorie versus low calorie or fasting and, not, and all they do is that that's all they do. They live in a laboratory. They study that from every perspective you can imagine. And basically what they say is exactly what you just said, Deborah, a moment, a few moments ago, which is doing fasting like a couple times a week can give you some of those health benefits without missing out on the vitality benefits. Yeah. And so that's key. And that's, that's actually what I do personally. Like I'll push breakfast till sometimes till 1 PM, right? It's not really breakfast anymore, but you know, skipping a meal and staying well hydrated till like 1 PM or 10 or 10 AM or 11 AM, you know, depending on what time I get up, but it'll be It'll, it'll be only a couple of times a week and you're going to get that fat burning effect. So the benefit, so like, why does that work? It's because when we don't have that nutrient coming in, you're going to start pulling more from your fat stores because you don't have the additional nutrient store. But, but if you keep doing that, exactly what you're saying, Deborah, then what's going to happen is you're going to start pulling from your muscle reserves. You're going to start stressing your body more and you're going to start losing this thriving aspect of being having a truly nutrient dense diet and having all these cycles of like nutrient, nutrient, exercise, nutrient, fasting enough window to recover, nutrient, nutrient, exercise. Like you stay on that pattern. Okay, a little bit of extra fasting to get that extra longevity benefit, to get that additional fat loss. Like that's basically, would you agree? Like that's really what I'm, that's the best pattern. Completely. And, you know, I think it's also important to, to address two things. And there are some great questions here. I want to go back and like answer sure. every one of them. So we can actually talk about like what's for dinner, I think to hit, how do you get 30 grams of protein? So we definitely need to hit that. I'm going to get hungry talking about it, but that's yeah. okay. 
Um, I think, you know, we need to look at for, for women specifically, and, and it's more true of women. This is why I say it, guys, I'm not ignoring you because I think you can also fall into this. However, um, there's something called low energy availability. And back when we were younger, you may recognize the term female athlete triad, where uh, a young woman typically, but it could be an athlete of any adult age prior to menopause, lost her period. And the reason why she was exercising stringently, probably also then monitoring her calories very strictly and reducing them. So it was it was a flirt, you know, generally with an, an eating disorder and just another term for it. But now low energy availability is so true of like any age woman. Women in midlife, again, are susceptible to that because of the uh, increased susceptibility to stressors, right? So if we're not eating and what we're doing, by the way, if you're doing this is not your fault because for 30 or 40 years, we've all been saying the dogma of exercise more and eat less. And sometimes I, I know this to be true. Doctors are still saying it. And, you know, I think somebody's got to really look at what are you eating before they can tell you that they've got to look at how are you exercising because there may be a metabolic problem going on, you may be uh, insulin resistant, and, and those things are going to get in the way of you getting the results you want. But we need fuel. So to talk about, because a morning is a problem, like if you exercise in the morning, somebody's asking, I don't have time to eat and then let it digest before I work out in order to get that workout in in the morning. Let me tell you what we do for a low energy availability and for breaking that fast. Really, that's all we have to do. So you don't have to have a full breakfast to qualify as breaking the fast and giving you a little fuel. And if you are eating well, 24-7, 365, most of the time, you're having those high quality protein meals with lots of vegetables, some fruits, and you're getting in some resistant carbohydrates. Carbs is not the evil thing that you used to think it is. We need some of that for energy and for muscle. If you're getting that in regularly, you just need a little something. You don't have to have a huge meal. So often when I'm exercising first thing, I have, I'll have a cup of matcha. Some of you may be having coffee, but if you're putting coconut cream in it, I've got calories. I've got some calories breaking that fast, a little bit of fat. It's not just, you know, sugar and sweetener. That's probably not going to work for you or it could be half a banana and a smear of nut butter. It doesn't have to be a lot. It's just get something in so you've got something to burn on and then have that meal afterward, that high protein meal afterward. So I hope that clarifies and just kind of eases whatever you might be doing before makes it far easier. Before strength training, I sometimes will call it a simple shake protein powder with unsweetened almond milk in my case, but you might prefer just water and shaking that up. It's liquid. It doesn't stick in your stomach. It's not going to make you feel heavy. And you actually are starting the recovery of your workout before your workout. It's golden for those of you who struggle to gain lean muscle. Let's go to uh, some uh, questions. Now yeah. we got a lot of questions. So I think we'll Let's let's turn it from this because we've shared a lot. And then like, let's see what audience, where do you want to dig deeper? Because there's many different directions we could go. But, you know, Deborah and I both want to serve each of you audience, mem audience members the best. And I'm sure you all have some similar categories, probably have, probably have five or six, seven different categories of questions. So let's dig into those. Um, let's go back here we're talking about dinner robbie so where do you get 30 grams of protein what's that going to look like at your house tonight well i always try to go with the most natural source of meats right so like the most wild version so to speak the most naturally raised meats uh, i am absolutely uh, a meat eater i love animals but i just can't deny the science um, my, my best friend is a veg veg vegetarian and uh, I have nothing but respect for them. So there's there's a tremendous, my heart and my soul really has a lot of connection with vegetarians. I like, I totally get it. 
but I yeah. can't deny the science. So like, you know, so, so God bless you vegetarians. You guys are awesome. And I know I totally understand where you're coming from. So I first want to say that because it, it I think it's really, you know, food and all this stuff there, there's a lot of emotional mental connections. Like let's, let's talk about the elephant in the room because it's, it's not like, like we're like, like I emotionally feel this and like, well, the science says this and like, we kind of go back and forth. And I think it's like, you know, we're all here, we're all living this life and our goal is to thrive the most and have the best connections and the best happiness. So not always is the science correct. So I do want to kind of say that first. And it's, and so before we even go deeper, I think it's, for me, it's a really important area that's like, if that works for you, then let's talk about how to get you the healthiest results with that. So with that being said, dinner, protein, what do we eat at our house? So um, I am definitely a meat eater. I go with the most natural wild meats that I can. So um, it depends. Like one thing I think that's really important is just like we have phytonutrients, which is plant nutrients. We also have zoo nutrients, mm -hmm. which um, are coming from animals. So it's important for you to rotate your foods. Like you, yeah. you can have kind of the same nutrient dense uh, foods for a while, then switch. So when it comes to meats, I don't eat chicken, 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 and I don't eat beef, 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 or lamb, 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 like, but I eat all those things. I eat eggs. I eat about six to seven eggs every morning, full, whole eggs, uh, every morning, organic, flax, flax fed. Um, and then if you ask me about dinner, so um, it could be chicken one night, it could be beef, I, my ADHD is kicking in. So um, it could be chicken one day, could be beef, could be lamb another, depends on if Patricia and I are eating out, or are we eating at home? Um, one of the services that we really like and we use is called Factor. Uh, it's called Factor, and they prepare and deliver to your house healthy meals. So um, I have a wonderful mother, a Brazilian mother-in-law who actually lives with us. And so she, she, uh, she will prepare a lot of food for us, makes it really easy. She's in Brazil right now. So like now I'm more in like the normal household where I don't actually have someone making three meals a day for me. So like, what do I do when that happens? I, we buy this uh, food from Factor and they make some really nice, healthy meals. I'm absolutely no microwave. I no mic. I don't want my food radiated i would rather eat like a frozen block of chicken than i would put my food in the microwave so i do not use the microwave but we use something called a brava which will heat the food we set it on reheat and like we just take our factor foods put it on a plate put it in the brava and it's really fast and it's super healthy um so there's really no like i don't have a typical pattern one thing i do is um salmon salmon burgers um so and that that's probably the most common thing that I'll have as the last meal of the day is a uh, salmon. Uh, I really try to keep salmon in my diet and fish. Um, but yeah, that's a kind of an overall answer for that. Fantastic. So how, to how about give, you? Yeah, very similar. So I love, um, love wild meat. So, you know, rather than uh, ground meat or beef, I'll do bison far more. Um, and I just prefer the flavor actually now I've been doing that for about a decade. Uh, but I'll do elk and I'll do, um, venison, uh, definitely a wild salmon girl as well. I like seafood. So I'll do, I'll do cod, I'll do shrimp and I'll do crab. Um, and geez, I need a mother-in-law, darn it. So yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I got to figure that one out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But somebody was asking, what does 30 grams look like besides protein powder, right? So we're talking, you know, like to your first knuckle, you know, your, your hand. So my hand is not very big, but it's about five ounces of animal protein. So often if you're reading, like, what's the serving size? it'll often say in a serving might be three ounces or four ounces. You actually want about five and then safely you're over that threshold for some, some meats that may be about 35 grams, but you're definitely going to get that. So you want to look at getting that in almost any animal protein, you're going to be good to go. The challenge with um, vegetable options or plant-based proteins is it takes, you've got to eat a huge amount of volume in order to get the same amount of protein. And they all have carbohydrates and fiber. So you get full almost before you can get that quota. So someone was asking, 
what about like pea protein and um, amino acids? And I, I'm a fan and I'm a believer that if you're going to go vegan, definitely, and potentially vegetarian too, amino acids will definitely help you get over the threshold. So what we're talking is like the supplements, you could get them in powder or take them in a pill form. And trust me, you will take a lot of them because that's like five, they're horse pills, but that takes about five to be a serving equivalent to 30 grams of protein but you may want to do that as a way to bump. And what I find among the vegans and vegetarians in our community is it's a, it's a game changer as far as how they feel their energy level and what happens from the exercise that they were doing the right thing. It's just, they weren't getting the benefits they deserve because they didn't have that building block. I'm going to go in the chat here um so hey. for our audience members if you if like we're skipping your we've had so many posts which is awesome thank right. you perfection yeah. but if we miss your question i'm going to start like i'm going to start back like several so if like we missed your question you really want us to answer it just copy paste and and i'll make sure that we get it okay with that being said let's start somewhere around what about vegetarian protein is pea protein with amino acids good yeah that's actually a beautiful idea uh, yeah. absolutely love that pea protein is amazing and uh, very actually similar to uh, whey uh, off the top of my head some of my my uh, data experts you can remind me of which amino acid but they're actually pea protein and whey protein are very similar other than like one amino acid, which makes it very different. Um, so yeah, pea protein with a, 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 a complete protein. So a uh, like something like advanced bionutritionals, perfect aminos would could be a great option for you so that you're creating complete protein structures. That's actually a great idea. Uh, so if I'm kind of vegetarian, no meat, then do I use protein powder? And I would say yes, and Deborah would say? Yes. Yes, I would say yes. And then probably also a, essential amino acids. Um, and coming back to that, not to beat a dead horse, but you know, even women who are meat eaters, often as we're trying to bump up to that level of protein, it's just something many women are not used to doing. So it feels like I'm getting too full and I can't do that. They find the aminos are helpful because they can swallow a, a serving of that. And, you know, food first, let's do that, let's get the satisfaction, the pleasure and, and the flavor from it. But then if you're over full, don't, don't, don't do that, but use supplements to get the rest of the way. That's kind of my feeling. Yeah. And that's, yeah, totally agree. And one, one point that I might mention everyone is for these, um, using these uh, complete protein or essential amino acids uh, supplement. Um, it does have phenylalanine in it. And some of us, if you have trouble sleeping, you might not want to take your essential amino acids in the evening because it has a kind of a high boost of phenylalanine. And that can work kind of like a central nervous system stimulant and can affect your sleep. So I would suggest to have it mostly up through the afternoon and not into the evening. Like, so that that's one thing for everyone to consider, especially related to sleep. If it's not an issue, and you take it like, oh, I don't notice at all. Fantastic. No, no worries. But some people could be sensitive to that. Um, Lori had a really good comment. She was, she mentioned how shocked people can be because they'll like use a scale. They'll start weighing their food and be like, wow, I didn't realize how much even four or five ounces of lean of lean meat is. So, um, you know, it's really it's I think that's a really good idea. If you I'm not telling everyone to go out and like get a scale and like weigh your food for the rest of your life, but it's a really good idea to do for like two solid weeks, three solid weeks, once a year, one time a year for two or three weeks, measure everything, use a nutrition app, go like OCD, track everything. Now, if you do that for two or three weeks, you're going to be good for like the other 49 because you're, exactly. you're going you're to be so aware of what you're eating. So that's like a beautiful strategy that's so efficient. I highly suggest everybody do that. Um, let's continue on here. And so let's see here. Um, Randa, I have digestive issues and these days I know I don't eat enough, but most foods except protein make me feel lousy. Mm. Is it bad to eat a lot of protein to make up for not eating enough? 
can you eat too much protein? Um, Deborah, I'll let you go first on that one. Well, and I was going to answer that because Ruth also added a comment that I think we need to make some clarity here. So if you have existing issues, renal issues, kidney issues, uh, an existing condition that makes you vulnerable, you need to check with your physician, your medical care provider before increasing your protein. However, I will tell you from the deep dive on research that I've done, nowhere ever has there been anyone who's eaten too much protein or gotten too high in protein and caused renal issues. So it's not the, you know, oh, there's kidney problems that'll have from that. That's a myth. As far as the literature goes, there is nothing there to show that increasing your protein, you're going to get full before that could ever happen. So that said, if you may be unaware of what is your physical status, you should probably be having a regular checkup. Let's figure that out, okay? If you haven't, don't know your doctor by a first name basis, I think probably you want to do that. But otherwise, um, it's not problematic. So it's in the literature and believe me, because I advise this, you know, I'm very conscientious and, you know, I want to know for myself, for my family members as well, you know, there isn't anything tied to, can you eat too much protein? You're going to get full. However, I would come back to the root cause of that problem. And I would say, get, let's get to the bottom of why other things are bothering you so much. And there may be some gut dysfunction, maybe good bacteria, bad bacteria are off. So maybe time for, say, a stool test or another kind of test. So I would check with a functional health coach or a functional doctor and look at what would be the next step so that you can have the energy and vitality that you want, because they're probably micronutrients that you're not getting if you're isolating what you're eating down to just more protein and not really getting other things. Robbie? Um, so Randa, I know Randa's been working quite a bit on her, uh, her, her digestive issues. She has a lot of good professional help in that area. So first, Randa, the eating, just like Deborah just said, like, don't worry about eating too much protein but you will want to bring some other things in with that, like produce and making sure that you're staying well hydrated enough because you can kind of back up the system, so to speak, a little bit, and that can become an issue. So although protein's awesome from like a building block standpoint and biochemistry in terms of your digestive system, exactly what Deborah's saying, there's some other things. You might want to have some fermented food. You need to look at good bacteria, bad bacteria, do some real testing and adjust and optimize those things. I'm pretty certain you're already doing a lot of those things, Randa, and other audience members that this may apply to. If you're not doing that and you have similar issues, suggest you do that. Um, but you don't want to just eat like, you wouldn't want to just eat chicken breast and then like beef and like tuna and and this, this could cause some digestive issues. It's very important that you have your fiber and you have produce, you have fruits, you have vegetables, you have some healthy sources of carbohydrate, uh, such as uh, oatmeal, sweet potatoes, yams, you know, that type of thing. So, um, and then continuing on, I'm reading the chat. <laughs> and, okay. And uh, let's, let's do this also. Uh, well, we're, we're getting through so many, man, we have a very connecting audience that is, awesome. I know, right. <laughs> it's a hot topic, right? I yes, think when it yeah. comes to food, it's like you mentioned earlier, it's, there's that emotional piece. There's the, our own historical piece and what we thought, what we still believe. And, um, Jean asked me about the Bravo. That's a good question. So <laughs> Patricia, can you can you share? This is a good Patricia question. So uh, Patricia, can you share about the Brava and like potentially, you know, where people can get that? Um, share the link? Yes, you could share the link. Yeah. 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 I can do that. Okay. Awesome. And then um, uh, let's see here. Deb Faleskin asked a question here. I wanted to find it. Um, Deb, can you put, oh, let's see. 
Okay, so food is always best, but yeah, so if food's always best, but what not to eat if at home? So that's a really good question. Um, yeah, you can always bring your protein drinks with you. You know, it really depends on your schedule. What I used to, like, I think people were more, especially after COVID, they're more home-based than before. But yeah. what I used to basically advise everyone is like, if you want to stay eating healthy, there's four, there's four major steps to staying eating healthy. And the last one is eating the food. And the reason why most people fall short is they end up here with lack of preparation. So the first thing you want to do of the four essential steps to eating healthy day in, day out is have the right to go get the right food and have it in your house. Right. <laughs> then if the food needs to be prepared, it's like we buy factor and all I have to do is heat it up in the Brava. So, but you know, you might you need to have your meats or different things prepared. And depending on your schedule, if you have back-to-back -back meetings and you're like running the, the kids or grandkids somewhere or like whatever your schedule is, you need to have that food prepared depending upon your schedule. And you, you'll know what that is. So that's the second step. Third step is to make sure that food's always on you. So you always have that food prepared and with you. So like, you know, when I was out of the house all the time, I would take like a cooler, I'd bring the foods with me, I'd always have my foods with me. And then, and, and at first, it's like, ah, that's kind of a lot but of work, but actually, then it becomes faster than fast food, then it's super efficient. And once you get in the habit of that, it becomes very, very easy. It's actually crazily, it literally becomes faster than fast food. If you do those three steps, if you're staying, if most of your environment is at home, awesome makes it even easier. The last step is to eat the food. But if you skip those first three steps, it's going to make eating healthy really difficult. And then if you're like in the, and then you're fasting, you're, you do not want to eat like chicken breast and broccoli when you're fasting. You want to go back to the chocolate cake that Deborah mentioned and you want to eat a bunch of crap food that's high in carbohydrates, high in salt, high in fat, and it becomes very difficult to eat healthy. So that's the other thing. If you're eating consistently, it's actually easier to eat healthier because you're not as hungry, right? Especially if it's like the perfect amount of carbohydrates and fats and protein, and you don't, you're not like spiking your blood sugar and this type of thing. Um, let's go to, let's continue on with the chat, but let's, uh, let's open up to Q and A on a video. So go to the bottom of your Zoom toolbar and click reactions. I want to make sure we we answer everyone's question, but I think it'll be even more efficient if we connect uh, through video as well, video audio. Uh, so just click raise hand and you'll see your hand raised like that and we'll know that you want to connect with us. And while we're waiting for um, everyone who would like to connect with us or connect with us, uh, actually, let's do this. Let's go to audio visual connections and then we'll see if we have any chat questions we missed. Perfect. And we'll try to make sure we cover all the questions over the next uh, 30 minutes or so. So you pull a question. I'm going to do one interval. Are you ready? I'm going to sprint, grab a power cord and I'll be right back. <laughs> nice. Okay. You do that. You do that. <laughs> <-da>. she <is>. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you actually. I heard you. Oh, so okay. Yeah, um, I want to know like how, how latest thinking about its connection to breast cancer. If there's anything new on that, yeah. um, there and... is there is quite a bit new on that, and and you could still be in this very small category that is still higher risk when you when you look at it. So it really depends on your genetics and and what's going on with you. However, I mean, if you look at five and ten and fifteen years ago. The research actually is far less swayed to no, like it being an absolute. Um, there is somebody that you want to link to, and I I can't pull that up right now, but maybe, maybe Patricia could do that for me. So Lindsay Berkson, Dr. Lindsay Berkson is actually a doctor who's in her 70s. If she knew I told you that, she would have my head. She doesn't look <laughs> like it and she never tells that age, but she's been studying with key researchers on bioidentical hormones, on hormone replacement since she was in her early 20s. So literally 50 years. So imagine you and I, it wasn't even on our radar to think about this being an option. Um, she's had cancer five different times. She's on HRT. She said, I, it's saving my life. Um, 
but she also has several ebooks to read. She's sharing that now with practitioners who used to be adamant, you know, no, my, my patient has breast cancer. It's an absolute no. And they are now being much more open-minded about what they thought they knew and what is true now. So I would just recommend that we all do our own due diligence and then bring something to the attention of your physician if you're under somebody's care and say, is this a conversation we can open back up again? Great. Yeah. yeah. I had the feeling there was new thinking about this. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Berkson. So it's B-E-R-K-S-O-N. Great. Yeah. Uh, Deborah, I dropped a link in the chat. See if I dropped the correct one. Please. Yes, that is absolutely it. Thank you so much. Oh, yes. thanks, Patricia. And um, Deborah, with uh, all the awesome information that you're providing to our audience, where if if uh, if our audience members would like to get a hold of you or see, I mean, do you do like private coaching? How does how does your program work? How can how can people get a hold of you? Yeah, so um, I'm everywhere at Flipping Fifty TV. So Flipping Fifty dot com is all spelled out, all words. Everywhere else social. So it's flipping five zero TV. You can find me and we do all of the above. So I do a little bit of private coaching, not so much anymore. Cause you know what it's like running a business, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, when there's a person for whom that's ideally the best thing and they want to get right to, I don't want to, I don't want to go through a program. I know I need custom. I know, no, I want that on my time frame. I still do a, a little bit of that. So I start everybody with a 90 day consultation if they're interested in that, because there's no need to go further. If you feel like now you've got what you need and you can walk away, those of you who are disciplined and you've got a plan and you understand the criteria for how this is how I'll progress after I do this. So that's a great place to start. And there are a lot of other ways just to put your foot in the door and say, could I listen to this voice even again for a second? Uh, so there are little things that you can do to get started and you'll find all those at flipping50.com. Awesome. And Patricia has provided that in the, in the chat now, flipping 50. Thank you. And, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Patricia. And uh, just, let's let's continue on to uh, Q and A. Um, Mark Mark J is next. I'm going to ask you to please turn your video camera on if you can. If not, or you're in a place where you shouldn't turn your video camera on, then don't. But otherwise, please do. <laughs> and uh, we'll give you a moment to do that. And also, he doesn't you... have cam. Okay. All right, so I'll bring you up with us and I give you a link there to unmute yourself. So let's bring Mark up with us, Patricia. We can't because it doesn't have a oh. camera. Oh, okay. I think you can speak there though. I gave you the link to unmute. So go, go ahead, Mark. And we'll give you a moment. Your audio doesn't look like it's working. Not working. Okay. You can, you can type your question in the chat and uh, Patricia will make sure that we get to that. And let's see who is next. Uh, it looks like we had some hands raised. It looks like I may have. The question came in the chat. From Mark. Oh, okay. Is the bioidentical hormones okay for 65 plus year old women? Deborah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so here's the status. I'm 58. And like a lot of my functional doctor friends, I don't anticipate going off. I'm probably going to die with my bioidentical hormones. I mean, there's just so much. I mean, we talked about fasting really, but there's so much benefit to bone and to muscle, you know, for, for a big two, but also to guess what your brain, which becomes a woman's big risk factor. If you've watched anybody suffer with Alzheimer's or dementia, it's a bigger concern probably if that, but yes. And to answer that question and go one deeper, just anticipating an intuitive question that might come next. 
what if I, I am 65 and I never went on it? So I, I'm more than 10 years post-menopause because often doctors will say within 10 years, you should do it. That's actually, if you're discussing, you're open to the idea of working with a functional doctor, it's for bioidentical hormones, you can be past that 10 year mark and still be a good candidate for bioidenticals. So you want to, you want to go in and unpack that and have that discussion, but it's a game changer for a lot of women and, and definitely changes your expectations about energy and aging. And then I wanted to answer Carol, Carol Peterson's question in the chat. Um, do amino acids provide protein or just aid in protein synthesis? Uh, so technically they aid in protein synthesis. They, they aid in actually developing a complete amino acid structure, uh, sorry, a complete protein structure. So the essential amino acids that you're taking will give you the amino acids your body can't make and your body will make the other ones creating a complete protein structure. So technically they're not giving you a protein, but if you really step back and thinking about it, they actually are truly giving you a complete protein uh, source. It's not a way that's going to easily give you an abundant or a lot of protein, but if you're eating um, a lot of other incomplete protein sources like vegan type of foods, vegetarian type foods that have protein, but they're incomplete. So they're missing a few or a couple amino acids to be a complete protein structure, that essential amino acid will help fill that in. That's that's basically what it's doing. Thank you, Deborah. And I wanted to answer one question in the chat really quick before we then go on to Ronnie. And uh, what are so Candace asks, what are the essential amino acids we should have in our diet? So there's 20 essential, there's 20 amino acids that build up a complete protein structure, uh, nine essential amino acids. And so basically what most individuals do if they're trying to get into these essential amino acids, like, yeah, you could really, I mean, you can look up these things in a nutrition reference, reference like app, but uh, typically you would just take an essential amino acid supplement and those amino acids are histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, uh, phenylalanine, threonine, um, tryptophan and valine. So those are your essential amino acids. And again, typically you don't try to like get one at a time. You would just take an uh, essential amino acid supplement that gets all of those in at once uh, to help complete the uh, protein structure. But if you're eating enough protein, you don't really have to worry too much about taking essential amino acid supplements. It's mostly, that's really helpful and beneficial for those who aren't getting in enough amino acids or really trying to optimize their protein intake. Um, which is a lot of individuals actually. So, um, so if you're kind of not hitting those protein numbers, which Deborah and I both agree, which is really cool. Um, most never other than Deborah, I've actually never met another expert that recommends exactly what I recommend, which is a grant, which makes a ton of sense, a gram per pound of lean body mass. That's what you, that's like a really healthy range uh, and I already know I, Deborah doesn't want to like over recommend protein and like or under, but um, some of the best protein experts in the world, like Jose Antonio, who've had on my show, he's the number one uh, protein researcher in the world. He actually pushes for and advocates for a gram per pound of body weight. Uh, Deborah and I both go a gram per pound of lean body mass because it's like, well, what if you have 80 extra pounds of body fat on you? Should you mm. really, do you really need a gram per pound? of uh, for for amino acid for a protein right so that's why we both uh, agree with that number um so if you're a leaner body weight and you are really active and you're doing strength training and aerobic training and all these things then we we would kind of i'm sure i'll ask deborah here but i i would then push for a gram per pound of body weight not just a gram per pound of lean body mass would you agree with that deborah I'm going to throw a, a wrinkle in here. So, you know, I think when you talked about what if, you know, we're carrying more weight, then the supposation would be that you probably want to lose some of that excess weight. And that is where you're probably going to try to create some kind of a caloric deficit. But usually then we recommend that your protein intake goes up by about 15% so that when you lose weight, you're not losing the muscle. We're making sure that it's fat. So there is that 
you know, here's a point where it will be important to increase your amount of protein intake. Um, and yes, so totally, I would agree. You know, it's it's super important to look at, first of all, where are you now, right? So I think it's important to take a look at what's the average that you're taking in most meals and over the course of a day. And what we're first trying to do is let's close that gap rather than give yourself that arbitrary, I have to make this or I'm not successful, start closing your gap. And that's going to be the biggest source of benefit to you. And then uh, Eva asks, are, I heard folks 65 or over 70 years must, uh, must, uh, must have 70 to 72 grams of protein. Well, that, again, that really depends on your, well, actually your gender, your body weight, how much physical activity you're doing, how much muscle mass you have, all those things help determine uh, how much. So I would definitely not go with, it's kind of like water, the whole eight glasses a day, 10 glasses a day. Well, that depends. Like, you know, I live in Phoenix, Arizona, where it's, you know, it's still almost a hundred degrees at on October 1st. Right. So, and so does Deborah, actually, we live in the same area. So, so, you know, it's totally different than if you're living in like, you know, somewhere that's like 60 degrees this time of year or 65 or something and has 80% humidity It's totally different. And then you have one individual super physically active and the other one's not that uh, active and they, you know, they live in different climates. So those things can drastically change. And that's also true for protein. I'm talking about water and protein here because they kind of look at it in a similar sense in terms of that. Like, what is your physical activity? What is your body type? What is your environment? Then that would determine. So, but for simple numbers, Eva uh, or Eva, sorry if I pronounce your name incorrectly, um, is, is a gram per pound of lean body mass. Deborah's recommendation, which actually makes a ton of sense, is if you're really overweight, you can actually boost your protein even more because you should actually be bringing your carbohydrate and fats or your energy nutrients down a little bit because you're going to use your body fat for that fuel. And then those excess amino uh, proteins are going to help preserve the lean muscle mass that you have already on your body while you're losing weight. Um, so now we're going on to Ronnie. Hello, Ronnie, and welcome. Hi, um, I live in Hawaii and we drink a lot of water here too. You wouldn't think you, it's a humid con, um, environment, but it's very warm. So we drink a lot of water. So I have a 26 ounce thing that I eat, drink at least two or three of a day, just because, you know, it's, it's nice to drink water. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, um, what, what is a good starch to eat? I mean, you know, my son is a bodybuilder. So he's big on protein and rice. That's his like go-to, okay? He eats eggs eggs and egg whites for breakfast. He eats um, protein and rice for lunch, protein and rice for dinner. But I keep, and I keep trying to tell him that just eating rice is not necessarily the best kind of carbohydrate to eat. I mean, we eat vegetables too, because I eat a lot of vegetables and so does he, but but I, I like to be able to cook something besides rice that I could, I like rice, but I mean, living in Hawaii, everything you get comes with rice. Let me put it that way. Unless you say, don't put any rice on it. And so, um, um, but at home, I would like to be able to cook something that is, uh, gives me some carbohydrates, but doesn't, um, I, I just don't feel like rice is the best. And he likes white rice. Okay. Because he says that's easier to digest. And I go, whatever, but what's your opinion on that? First of all, first yeah. of all, I love you. <laughs> and when are you inviting us to Hawaii? That's my yeah. <laughs> Come on down. You might have to sleep on a uh, blow up mattress in my office, but you know, other than that. <laughs> and eat a lot of rice. And eat yeah. a lot of rice. That's right. <laughs> You want me to grab that first, Robbie? Go ahead. Go ahead, okay. Yeah. So, and I think we're probably on the same page with that. But what we call resistant starches are the go to. So, the resistant, the word comes from resistant to fat storage. So, it, when we were all younger, most of us learned these as complex carbohydrates, but they're your sweet potatoes, um, a white potato, but 
cooked, cooled, because the enzyme property changes. So that way it becomes a resistant starch and not rapidly absorbed like sugar is. So the rice that he's taking in actually is quite rapidly absorbed. So though it might work for him with high energy needs, may not work for you if you have divergent goals, right? Yeah. So <laughs> sometimes you tell him, here's the pant, honey. So that's how I deal with that. But then <laughs> um, beans, uh, legumes, uh, winter squashes like butternut squash, those are kind of all, you know, uh, natural plant sources of food that is resistant starch. If we look at fruit, we get a little bit higher sugar content. So when I'm looking at if you are really sensitive to sugar carbohydrates and have some insulin resistance, I would suggest berries and citrus fruit because they're the highest nutrient dense, the lowest amount of sugar. And, you know, like when we were toddlers, you know, eat your vegetables first because fruit is always going to taste better. And that should be, you know, at the end of the meal. But mm -hmm. Robbie, do you want to chime in on that? Yeah, that I'm, we're a hundred percent on the same page. Um, you know, yams, oatmeal, rice is not necessarily a brat, bad thing. Um, you know, there's, there's kind of like this debate between brown rice having like phytates and, and then white rice, not, and they, all this issue. So, um, you know, brown rice does have a little bit more nutrient uh, value to it. And it is, it does, it is um, slower digested. It does have a higher fiber content. So it will be higher, slower digested. It won't be hit the bloodstream as fast. So therefore it's not going to spike the insulin as much. Um, so, you know, with carbohydrate, you have two things. You have what's called glycemic index, which Deborah started alluding to about the baked potato, which that's actually a really interesting fact, by the way, Deborah, in terms of cooling potato, it makes okay. a ton of sense, which is why a lot of people like, not to get off track, but there's some relationship here. Like a lot of people say, well, they like to drink room temperature water because it agrees with your body better. Well, it's just near closer to your body temperature. So you absorb it a little faster, whereas cool water is going to have to change your body temperature before it's absorbed because your body wants it to be in a certain state to go from digestive system to actually inside your body. So with the baked potato, you know, that makes a ton of sense. Um, so uh, there's glycemic index and that's how fast this gram or each gram or each structure of glucose or carbohydrate gets into the bloodstream and therefore elicits the response of spiking your insulin, right? So, you know, depending upon, there's that, there's glycemic index, but then there's glycemic load and load is like, well, how much, how much, like, like watermelon has a high glycemic index, but has a low glycemic load. So when you put the two together, it's not going to be such a huge impact. Then you also have to consider, are you eating it by itself? So you're sitting down and eating a half of a large watermelon, right? Most people won't do that. I would do that type of thing because I really love watermelon and I can eat a lot, but, but most people want it. But the with point Marty? is, yes, with my dog who absolutely loves watermelon. So, um, so there's glycemic index and glycemic load. And if you mix other foods in, then the whole thing kind of grays out and mixes the whole picture together. So we have to look at, are you bringing it in by itself? If not, what else are you bringing in, right? Like there's the zone diet that was talked about for quite a while is a big thing. And there's a lot of effectiveness to that. And it's basically like, if you're going to eat bread, put butter on it because butter will slow the digestion of the carbohydrate and make it different. So you kind of have to know all these things to like understand how it's affecting your body. So my suggestion in simple terms is yam, sweet potatoes, um, brown rice, white rice would be good like right after a workout because your mm -hmm. glucose has been decreased, it's dropped, and also your blood is circulating faster and your blood, um, your muscle cells have uh, something called GLUT4, which is glucose transporter four that comes to the cell wall mm -hmm. to absorb the glucose into the cell. And when you exercise, you increase the sensitivity of drawing glucose into your cells. So a good time to eat those carbohydrates that you really love, like some of the sweets and that type of thing, if you must have them, a great time to do it is right after the workout. And the reason why is because you're going to absorb those differently. You're not going to spike your insulin as much. And you actually might have an additional anabolic effect, which is more muscle cell gaining because you had the fast digesting carbohydrates afterward. So, um, 
back to the list. Yams, sweet potatoes, um, brown rice, oatmeal. Like most, some people have, a lot of people have some level of gluten allergy. So this won't work for a significant percentage. But if you don't, things like whole wheat bread or sprouted grain and that type of thing does have a robust amount of uh, nutrient density to it. So those would all be a really good carbohydrate. I am a fan of fruit. Um, and again, like if you eat fruit with those other foods, you're going to change how fast those, because it doesn't have a lot right. of load, but it can have a high glycemic index. So I think, does that give you like a full picture about carbohydrates and how to think about, oh, and the one more thing, and I'm really going on a, a rampage here, but the, um, the white rice, you don't want to do white rice, white rice, white rice, because you're missing out on a bunch of nutrients mm -hmm. by doing that. And if, yeah. Yeah. And so that, that's really one of the biggest problems. You want to rotate those foods to get better nutrients. Okay. A lot of times I just don't eat the rice, but that's because, you know, I'm a, I'm a big vegetable fan. So I will like eat three times as much broccoli and then not have the rice and let him have the rice. But uh, yeah, um, the second, the second question I had I, I really appreciate that. that was very good information. The only question I have about that, the what you said was that my understanding was like things like sweet potatoes and things like that are have a high, I know they have a lot of fiber. Mm -hmm. So they, it kind of, it balances out the, the carbohydrates or the, you know, because you don't want to have too much, the sugar and fiber kind of combination. So, um, but I, I was wondering if that's, um, if you're trying to cut down on things like sugar is our sweet potatoes still a good, a good uh, thing to eat? Yes. Yeah. So you, okay. Yeah. So, and that's why we specifically that family of resistant starches mm -hmm. would be okay. the best choices. Yes. Okay. The second question I had was uh, exercise. Deborah, I am 73 or I will be in another two months. And I am five foot five. I used to be five foot six, <laughs> five foot five. And I weigh about 260 pounds, which is way, way too much, like about a hundred pounds too much. And so um, I, I used to exercise a lot. And then about, it actually started about 14 years ago when I broke my ankle and my leg and I wasn't allowed to put any weight on it for a long time. And then afterwards I had to be really careful. And then just one thing after another happened. And um, now I'm retired for the last two, almost three years. And that's just made it worse. So you'd think I would be exercising more because I have all this time, but that doesn't always happen. So, um, um, but I, I know walking is probably the best thing to start with, but um, what at, Besides walking, what would be the next step, do you think? What do you love? Pregnant. As far as exercise, I like to dance. So well, okay, dancing. Then. Let's get some music going, girl. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, your walking might be dancing. But, um, you know, I think it's really, let's not go shopping for the best exercise. Let's shop for the best for you. And that's the one you're going to do consistently. Mm -hmm. And that's the first step. Because once you're consistently doing it, feeling better, you know, whether you love exercise or you don't, and, and that's collectively to anybody, your endorphins will kick in in spite of you. You will feel mm -hmm. better for having done it. And we like to repeat things that feel good. So you kind of want to be in that cycle of, yeah, I'm going to do that again. And just doing a little bit regularly and gradually increasing by two minutes a week. By the end of the month, you've done eight more minutes. By the end of two months, you've done 16 more minutes. I mean, <laughs> you're going up and you're going in the right direction. I would start with that and start with what would I love to do today? Okay. Totally. Yeah. Thanks very That's, much. You're like being, welcome. Thanks for asking. Being fit is um, so, you know, a lot of people say like, oh, fitness is 80% nutrition or like, you know, and they have all these ideas about these percentages and stuff. But what I actually say is um, being fit and healthy is actually 99% mental, emotional, right? And so um, 
So basically, you know, your body speaks the emotions of your mind and such. And so you have to do things that your body enjoys doing first. And you have to connect your mind and your energy around doing that thing. So I totally agree with Deborah. The first thing you want to do is find the physical activities that you enjoy doing. And once you're in motion and you're like, you're into physical activity, my suggestion is then to look how you optimize your body mechanics because by optimizing your body mechanics and moving forward in fitness, and then that's where you're going to get the best results. And then like what Deborah would share with you as well, if I can speak for her uh, for a moment, she's, she's amazing at giving you specific things so that like, you're not over stressing your body and you're doing the perfect amount of exercise to get the very best results and such. So, you know, that's where those things come next, but it's like, where are you at in, in the spectrum? You don't need to go like to the nth degree yet. You know, it's better to first get into physical activity. If that's an issue and it's a difficult trying to create a habit and a pattern, the first thing you need to do is like love exercise, love yourself and love exercise and love physical activity. Once you start to get in the realm, then you can start to look for those next steps of optimization. Um, okay. We're going to drop the link again for Deborah's um, training system and how you can get a connection with her. So uh, Patricia, if you go ahead and drop the link for that in the chat and, uh, and let's see if we have any other questions before we sign off from today's show. Awesome. So you, you all have been an absolutely amazing audience. Very much enjoy connecting you, with all yeah. of you. Great, great questions. Great connection. Uh, much love to all of you. And we are going to sign off for now. Deborah's information, if you'd like to get in connection with her, is in the chat. And also our Full Body Fix event is coming up in November. Patricia can drop a link on that as well. And much love to you guys. And we look forward to seeing you again very soon on the show. Deborah's amazing. Make sure you don't miss the opportunities of connecting with her additionally. Right, um, this way. Yes. Yeah, that that away. This way. Right? That away, <laughs> like the beach, like the beach, right? Like that away. So, <laughs> so, uh, so Deborah's amazing. Definitely suggest you connect with her. We'll leave the meeting open for a moment in case you want to go back and look at any links, think at it, look at anything that I might have posted, that type of thing. We'll leave the meeting open for about 10 minutes. Otherwise, we'll see you all again very soon. Much love to you. Nice to see you all. Bye for now. <laughs>